the story of music it used to be that the only way to experience music was live, uh, whether it was at home, in a bar, in the street. And then um, music was broadcasted so you could experience it from a distance. Then you were, you were able to access the, music, the song you wanted on demand. And then you were able to bring the music at home, new evolution. With the cassette tape, you were able to actually record music and put it in the way you want it, make your, make your own mixtape, your, uh, your own playlist. And with the Walkman, you were able to take that music with you on the go. The CD brought um, high quality and reliability. And then with the iPod, suddenly you had access to maybe a thousand songs in your pocket. Today we're like at this stage where with the smartphone you have access to any song, anytime, anywhere. It's a big evolution. So if we look back, what we realize is that really you can't buy music. When you think about it, if you listen to it on the radio, uh, advertisement was paying for it. In the jukebox you actually rented the music for one play. Um, maybe you, uh, you bought this, the record but then you bought the tape again for the same music, and then you, you bought the CD. So you never really bought the music. What you buy is actually the medium. And today, the apps are the new medium. It's not like a surprise, like if all those big media companies today are really going after those apps. Everyone has an app store. And there's a lot more stakeholders there's about 50,000 new songs that are being published digitally every week. And about one million people are accessing music information every single minute. That's in the US only. So a lot, a lot of stakeholders, a lot of companies want a stake of that music property on the internet. Mobile companies, ISPs, consumer electronics, streaming services, social networks, video games, editorial site, branded entertainment. And so as a result of that, the old gatekeepers, the labels, the radio DJs, the record stores, they're sort of losing control over this discovery of music uh, to the new gatekeepers, who today are the music application developers. These are the guys that actually are creating the experience, the new music experience of discovery. So what, what, do we, what can we observe uh, from this? Well, MP3 has become obsolete. Today, songs are the new, uh, are now URLs. So welcome the API. The APIs, for those who don't know, uh, they're application programming interfaces, and they, they're kind of the building block to create uh, uh, an application on the web. And so the Econest, uh, is a music intelligence company. We are the big data development, development platform for music. And by platform, what I mean is that we uh, work with inter independent developers and media companies. We provide the data and the service, the tools for them to actually create those new experiences, those new applications around music. And our mission is really to connect the audience, the listener, to the music that they love, and as well the artist to the market, to their audience. So you can think about this like, say, play me a playlist, play me some music that is similar to Stevie Wonder, right? So we're trying to give the right answer to that. Or maybe you're a DJ and you're like, okay, play me some music that sounds like this particular pattern, beat, whatever and we're trying to answer those questions. Maybe you have something a little bit more complex, like I'm going to have a dinner party, so play me some relaxing dinner music that my guests are going to like. Or maybe you're going to go for a run, and so can you play me some trendy stream of electro pop, because you're really into electro pop, that will help me run faster and longer. We're trying to answer those questions. My favorite is this one. Can you play me some new music? 
that doesn't exist, but that sounds like James Brown. And so we're, we're helping a bunch of companies, um, some obviously you've heard about. Uh, and we're trying to answer all those different questions. Um, and a lot of them are using us for playlisting, for recommendation, for discovery. And to give you an idea of like uh, the company numbers, uh, right now we're about 70 people in two locations, Boston and San Francisco. And everything we do is automatic. Uh, so we rely a lot on CPUs, computers. We've uh, indexed about 10 billion documents. So that's for about 35 million songs and 3 million artists. And 35 million songs represent about 100 billion different sounds that we've indexed. And there's about 30,000 developers working on our platform right now. And they've developed about 450 apps. Some of them I'll show later. Uh, to give you an idea of scale, uh, what is 500? Um, we've, we're analyzing about 500,000 songs per day. That represents about three years of listening. Uh, 35 million songs, unit songs. If you were going to listen to them continuously, 24 hours, seven days a week, you would have to have started uh, during the French Revolution. But because we work with many different you know, partners, we have a lot of duplicates, right? So we've actually analyzed more than 200 million songs. And that goes back a long time. Uh, so what do we actually do when we analyze music? Um, it starts with what we call machine listening. So a lot of models of perception and psychoacoustics are put into this. And what we're extracting is like the, musically, the musical kind of uh, attributes, such as tempo, key, time signatures, every beat, uh, every bar, where are the bars in the song, every sound event, and we kind of describe each sound event in terms of like their, uh, the color of the sound, the timbre, uh, the harmonic structure, each sound has like a harmony associated to it. Uh, the loudness curve of every sound. And then we have like sections. We know where the chorus, the verse, the bridges are. Um, and on top of that, we, we apply some machine learning to extract what we call subjective attributes, like some kind of arbitrary dimension that means something to humans and nothing to, to computers. So we train those models to describe what is the energy of a song, what is the danceability of a song. Uh, is it a song that's live, or is it a song that's recorded in studio? Uh, is it speech, actually, or is it music? Is it acoustic or electric? What is that mood in the song? Like, is it positive, negative? Um, is it instrumental, or does it have a voice in it? And all this takes about one second per minute of audio analyzed. So that's a big thing. It has to be extremely efficient. So an example of what comes out of this, so say you wanted to plot the entire Miles Davis collection uh, on, on this uh, 2D map with energy being the x-axis and valence, the y-axis, valence being you know, positiveness, negativeness. So, so you can see at the bottom left, you have like kind of low energy, kind of, uh, kind of moody type music, like more the melancholic music. So this is our, like, these are like more the, the ballads that Miles Davis composed. And at the top right, you get more the energetic stuff, kind of more uh, positive music. The size of the dot um, represent the acousticness. So the bigger it is, the more acoustic it is. So you have a lot of electric in the high energy, high balance. So this is like the second phase of Miles Davis. Uh, and the color represents uh, liveness, so you get all the live songs in, in red. The second thing we do is uh, machine reading, let's say. Um, this is about 
kind of crawling the internet and extracting information out of blog posts, news, reviews, every piece of music text that we can find. It's kind of like a little specialized Google in some way. But we go a step further in actually automatically reading the, those reviews, those blog posts, and extracting the musically informative uh, text. So adjectives that describe an artist, you know, uh, locations, uh, artists that are similar. Um, so this is a lot of natural language processing type stuff. And with that, we can do a lot of things like similar artists, finding which artists are similar, get a tag cloud for every artist with thousands of terms that describe the artist. We know if the artist is familiar, if he's like a trendy artist right now, uh, when was the artist active, uh, and we can extract and index you know, all these, th these uh, bios, blogs, news that we find along the way. This is about 10 million documents per day that are being analyzed this way. So an example, I'm, trying, I'm gonna try to do this live. Okay, so th this is kind of connecting all the cultural data together. So here's some information about going from Mozart, oh, to Pink Floyd, sorry. I, I probably, that'll, that'll work. So we're starting with Mozart. Mozart was a member of Dracul, what is that? Maybe it's not the right Mozart. Maybe it's another artist called Mozart. Draco <laughs> was had a member Lutz Demmler. Lutz Demmler was a member of this band. He performed with this band on the song Home Hometown. And you go like this, basically, from one artist to another, and eventually you get to Pink Floyd. Yeah, sorry. There's actually probably an artist called Mozart. Um, all right, I'm going to try to leave this thing and come back. Right. Third thing, uh, we apply a lot of machine learning, and this is about predicting uh, things, and essentially about listeners. Um, this is encapsulated in what we call taste profiles, and that allows us to basically build uh, an identity, musical identity, about uh, a particular listener. Um, so this is useful for per personalization, if you want to create a, a personalized radio. Uh, so we extract information that can predict the, sort of the demographics, the psychographics of a particular listener, uh, their pattern, listening patterns, given a time, day, uh, uh, location, that sort of thing. Uh, and we can extract what we also call uh, attributes, which tells us, for example, how adventurous are you as a, as a music listener, or how hip or hipster, there's a difference here. Uh, are you passionate uh, about the music you listen to? Um, do you listen to a lot of diverse music? So example of that, uh, what can we predict? So by s only looking at the music uh, content, we're, for example, like able to predict your political affiliation. So here are some examples of artists that are very predictable. So if you're a fan of those artists, we, we, can, we can predict that you're likely a republi Republican. And this is like the most kind of predict predictive artists. Um, obviously, if you're a fan of those artists, you're most likely a Democrat. But what's interesting here, it's not just that we can find those artists. These, are, these are one are pretty uh, obvious ones, but we can apply this to the three million artists we know, even though those, some of those artists obviously were never mentioned close to I'm a Republican or I'm Democrat, but we can extrapolate to whatever artists uh, with fairly good precision. Some of, of the artists, however, are not predictive of any uh, political affiliation. So, interestingly enough, that's a lot of metal and rock uh, type artists and the Beatles. Everyone loves the Beatles, right? Uh, another example is uh, predicting another medium like uh, a movie. So, fans that li like those artists, usually they like romantic comedies, right? And again, metal fans really don't like those Again, this is like the most predictive kind of um, uh, artists. 
so taste profile is, is a big is a big thing for us. We can sort of um, kind of measure your musical identity in a pretty deep way. Uh, so this allows us to, for example, cluster your modes of listening. So, you know, sometimes you might be into hip hop and some other times you might be into classical and there's probably a reason why you listen to these different types of music. A lot of people listen to a lot of different music, but they so somehow have different modes of when and how and where they listen to this music. So we can kind of cluster this and maybe in one of the cluster you have all your rocks, you know, you like, you know, indie rock and garage rock and blues rock, all into one, one kind of uh, mode of listening. We can also predict so uh, how mainstream you are in comparison to, in this case, this is our CEO, Jim Lucchese, in comparison to the entire like uh, Spotify um, audience, is a little bit less mainstream than, than the rest of the audience, which is in, in orange, uh, is listening to music that is a bit less fresh as well. Uh, but on the other hand, is listening to more diverse music than the average. Um, so let's take now Daniel Eck, the CEO of Spotify. He also has his clusters, right? He listens to different types of music. So now what's interesting is that we can sort of um, find what is, what, what is the intersection between those two guys. So suddenly you're going to have like things coming up like like the types of music they, they actually both like, um, the artists, the, the, you know, how, how uh, their identity kind of correlates with each other. And from there you can create a new playlist. And this is a playlist that will you know, be right for a certain time, certain location, and that both of them will appreciate. So we can do a lot of things with prediction and taking uh, those three components, taste profile for understanding the listener, uh, audio analysis that goes deep into s a single song and extract music information, and cultural analysis which looks at like kind of the entire world of music. Uh, we kind of have the best of all worlds and we can synthesize all this into one big machine that can predict you know, which artists you're more likely to like, which albums, which songs, uh, even other users that you should be kind of s similar to. Uh, we can give you a lot of analytics and find you know, the brands that should, you should be associated with and finding other media that you are going to like. Um, and all this, we don't think there's one solution to this problem, so everything is customize, customizable. Uh, you can weight every aspect of our, uh, of our engine and weight that together with the context in which you are in and of course who you are and get personalized results. So this is kind of like the product that we, that the Econest is. is it's a bunch of APIs that you can plug into to construct and build your, uh, your uh, experience, musical experience. And that's what we think it is. The future of music is about the experience. It's going to be how you present the music in the best way possible at the right time for the right occasion, the right situation. And where do we find the best innovation? Well, independent developers. So we organize these Music Hack Days all around, all around the world. And Music Hack Days is basically 24 hours where we put you know, about this size room of people uh, into one place, they come and they build uh, projects that they are interested in. Uh, there's no guidelines. They just have 24 hours to create something new, innovate, and present it to their peers. And so when you think about this thing, it's like, say, 350 developers who have real jobs. You know, they work at Google, they work at Apple, they work whoever, wherever. Um, let's say $120 an hour, right? For 24 hours, that's $1 million worth of innovation kind of like focusing on creating new applications over the weekend. And we work together with other music companies. Uh, you mu must uh, recognize some of them here. Uh, a lot of interesting APIs. What the Econest does, however, is we're kind of connecting all those partners together through what we call Rosetta Stone. It's kind of like a, an ID uh, 
um, matching uh, system. So basically, we know, you know, if you want to build an application that's streaming music from Spotify, but that's also linking to a live concert on Songkick, uh, and you want the lyrics from Music Cross Match, we can kind of re recognize those IDs, and for a single artist or single song, you can have all this information in one place. And crowdsourced innovation is not new. Something like you've seen all around uh, the internet already in social networking. You know, Facebook is using a lot of that, using developers to actually build on top of their platform. You see that in microblogging with uh, Twitter, video with YouTube, Flickr on photos, Google Maps, of course the iPhone or Android, you know, uh, Firefox for the web. So there's a lot of those applications being built. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, obviously, but I will sh I'll show a couple of them. Um, this one is interesting. So this is like uh, a playlisting engine that basically is taking your GPS information uh, and you say, for example, I'm leaving from Boston, I'm going to New York, uh, and it's going to build a playlist at every point uh, focusing on the artists that are actually located or from that area. So you're going to be you know, riding, uh, driving through those different uh, locations, and that's going to be music that originated from, the, from that place. Uh, this one is interesting. I wanted to show it live. Uh, I'm going to try to do that quickly. Uh, all right. Uh, actually, I think it's still here. All right, so this is kind of, I don't know if you know Pandora, it's like this uh, radio service in the US, and basically you can start with whatever artist, well, I have one here, you can play the music, I don't know if it's playing. Uh, go to the next song, right, and it's kind of like going through uh, a path of connection, so here from Radiohead we go to Blur, I cannot actually read this. You can actually move around and pick and choose the artist you want. And normally it's playing, but anyway. Right, and so it's going to create a radio that's going to navigate through your connection. And if you don't do anything, it's just going to stay around and kind of play all those artists. Anyway, you get the idea, right? Uh, okay. Where is my, okay. MTV built a different type of app, of application. Um, this is kind of a, an application to discover rising artists on the web. So you might not go through all the blogs and all that, but since we do, we can actually rank artists by how not popular how they are, but not how much they sell, but more like how fast they're rising through the blogosphere. Right, so they're kind of like uh, showing that. Plus, you get uh, their Twitter accounts. You get all kinds of information, uh, music, uh, video, and all that. And there's a lot of uh, discover uh, uh, visualization uh, possible. You can take the entire like you know artist world and visualize that. You can look at your own collection within that world. You can look at every song that you own, uh, every song that exists, like how they relate to each other. You can visualize one single song. There's many different ways to visualize. And I like this visualization. This is kind of a, a visualization of, of uh, genres. And right now, we've kind of, we have, I think, about a thousand genres or so that are visualized in an interesting way where it goes from organic to mechanical, kind of sounding genre, and at the bottom you get acoustic, and at the top electric. So this is kind of like all those genres kind of uh, put on a the map. Then you can kind of dig into a single genre, and you get who are the artists that are more uh, kind of relevant for that particular genre. So you can start listening by clicking the radio somewhere, and you can start going through all these artists and listening to an intro, basically, of what is this particular genre. And you can imagine thousand genres. There's a lot of things to, you can explore. Uh, a lot of mobile apps, obviously. Uh, the bigger one, probably for us, is uh, iHeartRadio. It's number two right now in the US after Pandora. 
Uh, we also power the music experience in, on Nokia. Uh, but what I would like to talk about uh, now is what I think is the next step. After all this stuff, like you, you obviously know all about uh, streaming music um, and discovery, recommendation, this has been around for a little bit of a few years now. Uh, so what, what's coming next? So I think it has to do with interacting with your music. Uh, what, that's what I call active listening. So going back to decades ago, so music used to be live and there's kind of a creative side and there's a listening side of music. There's those that actually engage in making music and there's the the other side where you actually just listen to the music. So there's the active side and the passive side. Um, but today, like, they kind of like, meet on, into this one device that you have, where you can create music on your device, you can also listen to music on your same device. It's a computer. So I think there's, a, there's now an opportunity to do something that's going back to a little bit more live music, something you can actually interact with. And I'll, I'll show some examples of that. That's what I call active listening. Not only this device uh, has access to millions of songs, pretty much all the music in the world, it's also a computer. So it's also able to emulate what fancy, uh, very sophisticated uh, music software can do today. And it knows a, lo a lot about the context. It knows if you're running, it knows if you're in a car, it knows if you're working now, it knows who your friends are, your social network, right? So some ideas of like things you can do now with uh, this sort of thing. So you can auto mix. So like this is the DJ experience. So I'll play a little example of uh, of auto mixing between two Bob Marley songs. You can do auto auto mashups. So you can take a lot of songs and start like mashing them up all together. Sorry? <laughs> um, uh, this one, if you haven't seen it, I think I should show it uh, live. Um, this, it's hard to explain, it's much easier to actually see in action. So this is kind of like representing a song. So you can upload any song to this site uh, and it's rep representing the song in a circle. Uh, and each little line you see is a beat in the song. And the, well, the, the, the arc are represent kind of a, the connection between one beat and another similar beat uh, within the song, the same song. So you, you sort of see visually that there are some kind of like chorus that repeats in some way in that song. But then you can play it, which is like the interesting part. And you can jump, stop jumping between um, between uh, those different beats. Kiss, I was looking for this, but now you're in my way. Your stare was holding, red jeans, skin was showing. So it's kind of a random jump. Where you think you're going, baby? Hey, I just met you. So now we're in the second chorus. We're back to the first chorus. So you can pretty much listen to this song for like eight hours if you wanted. It would never stop. <laughs> Not something you want to do, but... <laughs> um, another transformation of songs you can do, this is a hack I built actually uh, during a music hack day. Um, this is the same idea. You upload a song and it's going to do a transformation to it. And in this case, it's going to turn a, any song into a swing song. So you all know this particular song. OK, 
Okay, here's the swing version of it. Or this one. Um, you can go a step further and try out try to turn any 4-4 four four song into a 3-4 song. So how does that work? So here's like, uh, you know, a 4-4 four four song. So 1, 2, 3, 4, right? So if you like kind of split uh, those 4 beats into 2 groups of beats and then you extend, stretch the first beat and the third beat to kind of like like this, like, to mul like you extend by 2, those 2 beats, then you, you're going to get the feeling that it's a, a one, two, three, one, two, three type uh, song. So then you can restretch everything to get the same length or something kind of similar, and then you get a three, four song. So here's an example of a four, four song. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. And this is the three, four version. One, two, three, one, two, three. And we didn't throw anything, we kept the whole thing, just changed it a little bit. Another one, this is the 4-4 version. And the 3-4. And all this is automated, so now you can start thinking like, how do we put all this stuff together and create new things? Uh, so this guy built uh, uh, this website, P Peter Sobo, um, that would take any song and now turn it all together into a new style. Uh, so it's a little bit more advanced in some way, but he has templates of what a style means and rules, and then it, he uses the sounds from uh, that song that you uploaded and convert it into something new. So here's an example with the same Janet Jackson song. <laughs> This is a drum and beat style. Uh, drum and bass, sorry. Another one with uh, James Brown, that's uh, more like the Wub style. Oh, you get the idea. You can create uh, automatic video games like uh, you know gu Guitar Hero style, uh, like this, and play your own music basically. And uh, you can play with video. So this is actually another hack I built at a music hack day where I uh, downloaded all the Soul Train video. I don't know if you know Soul Train, it's an old uh, kind of uh, TV shows from the 70s where people were dancing on music. Uh, so I, I took that video, I analyzed the audio of the video, then I threw away the audio and I built an automatic uh, auto-mixed kind of a playlist, uh, radio, uh, with 70s music, at a particular tempo, uh, very highly danceable, and beat match, right? So then you can take the video, you, the, all the video you have, and that stream of music where you know uh, where the beats are, and time stretch the video so that it kind of sync to the, to the audio. So the, the actual uh, video is time stretched. And it's kind of taken randomly from those different sequences. <laughs>
uh, and maybe the most kind of pushing the, the limit a little bit of what we can do with this stuff. Uh, that's what I call music synthesis. So imagine you have all the music in the world organized in a certain way. Maybe it's your favorite music. Maybe it's like, you know, mo most danceable music, the most electronic, whatever, or anything. Uh, what if you can traverse like this nebulous of music and basically create what's missing in between those different songs that exist, right? So like maybe in the top here, you're like piano kind of music, so you're going to be creating piano music. Uh, and it's going to take basically the structures of all those different sounds that are around you. Uh, what's the tempo of the, you know, the kind of interpolated tempo? Uh, what is the, the particular rhythm and the timbral uh, features of the different sounds and the harmonies and everything? And so you can create something entirely new that didn't exist before, but that's taking the sounds and the structures of all these different pieces. Um, so I'm going to show you an example of uh, composing entirely automatically uh, with 50 songs. Uh, so it's a you know, beginning, but this is actually at least 10 years old. Uh, but uh, what's interesting is the, the, the synthesis part is actually uh, the hardest part. It's like, how do you put those little pieces of sound together to create something new. So you get this. Um, each individual sound is from a different file. Uh, so there's no kind of long pattern or anything. It's like really trying to compose by notes one at a time. <laughs> I'll stop here, but it could go forever, right? Um, so just to conclude, I think the future of music is really about the experience, and it's really like, you know, we still have to invent the experience. What is the experience that we really want? Because just having access to, to audio is not going to make it. You know, that's going to be a given. That's a commodity now. Everyone has access to everything. So how do you create those experiences? And I think you can build it now. Like, it's, we have all the tools. We have everything we need. It's just a question of being creative and uh, thoughtful, uh, thinking about design, thinking about everything that comes into account when you make an experience and build it now. Uh, that's it. Thank you. I'm going to try to read some questions I have here. How do you pick, pick up bands how to get included in your service? Well, that's pretty easy. If you're uh, working somehow with any of our partners, uh, then you, you'll be included by default. You know, it is no, uh, it's no like, particular way to get in. So for example, if you wanted to be on Spotify, it's very easy, right? You go through CD Baby or through one of the services that get included into Spotify. And since we analyze Spotify, then you're going to be included. And you can get discovered in the same, uh, as, 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 as uh, easily as anyone else. Um, I don't understand this question. OK. Damn, what are these questions about? <laughs> there were some two new oh. questions this uh, in, in the channel. You, knew, you, you see one? Oh, right, right. Two, okay. Four minutes and this six days. It's so okay. The so the second question is how are you? I'm fine. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, any other questions? Anyone? Oh. Style of the song is like machine 
Okay, I get it. So I'll repeat the question very quickly. Uh, the question was, we use a lot of techniques to basically or like understand music. Uh, uh, can you analyze you know, music from uh, my band like, uh, that I just created in the garage? And if it's, can you define whether it's as good as another song or artist? Um, you know, that already exists and can you make it basically grow, right? Um, well, the answer is yes, we can identify the musical components of the song that are similar to other songs and uh, if there is any presence of the artist on the web, we can find that information and put it into the context of other artists. Now, we're not defining what goodness means, so it's not like we're going to like push this song and say, wow, this song is really good. You have to really listen to it. What we're going to say is like, if you're really into chili, Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, well, if this band really sounds like it, and what you really want to hear as a fan of really, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers is actually unknown music that sounds like Red Hot Chili Peppers, then we can find that, right? But if you're into, you know, uh, popular bands like Red Hot Chili Peppers, then that one is not gonna necessarily going to get pushed up. Um, any other questions? Oh, <laughs> Twitter now. Okay. Is it? Oh, can you explain in more detail how you convert a song to a set of features? Wow, that's uh, pretty deep. Uh, I mean, I tried to explain. Um, a given song, as I say, like you extract uh, the information by, you know, it's a, it's a mix of psychoacoustic, DSP, uh, machine learning, uh, and then, uh, I, I'm not going to go into too many details, but extracting the, the musical information in, in the song uh, and categorizing that, uh, then turning that one song that has a lot of information into single smaller vectors, let's say, of um, you know, X numbers that represent maybe the rhythm structure of that particular song, the harmonic structure of that particular song, the timbral structure of that particular song, the tempo and maybe the tempo change or whatever. And then you can, co like you can find metrics that find the similarities between this particular song and another song because they are kind of represented in the same way. Uh, on top of that, there's the uh, cultural side of things. So we do kind of the same thing for artists that represent that song. The artist you know, as a, is from a particular country, particular town maybe, uh, is represented in those particular genres by people. He plays this particular instrument. Uh, maybe it's a female singer. All that stuff is kind of also used. And the descriptors that people use, you know, uh, fun music, uh, I don't know. And all those stuff in the same way is going to be compared to every other artist. So this is kind of like our way to look at music. Um, and then there's a the listener aspect where you're trying to find what is in the listener that correlates with the music that they usually listen to to help them find the other songs that they might be interested in. I don't know if I answered the question, but that's pretty much what I already talked about. We can talk after. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. All right. Thank you.